decided that uh, it would be very good to kind of commemorate his kind of contribution to the department, but also to Welsh art as well. I mean, I think it's important to say that Peter was a renowned and really important um, Welsh artist of national significance. He was in major shows uh, in, in, in a big show called The Hard One Image that had a lot of British painters in to do with painters that were working in a particular way um, that was to do with kind of observation um, and creating something from things in the world. So he was known in Wales and he was known nationally. Um, and so the idea that we have a prize that kind of celebrated his commitment, particularly to drawing, because I think everybody who knew him and was taught by him um, kind of will talk about his enthusiasm for, for drawing and a great proponent of drawing in a very dynamic way, a very, a very kind of uh, a way which is about people dealing with what they can see, their situation in the world, which was not really academic, it had academic elements, but it was actually about valuing people's real experience. And Peter was somebody who, um, you know, he was dyslexic, he, he found it difficult, I think, at school, from what I understood when I spoke to him. Um, he struggled and he used his art as a, a form of self-realisation, if you like, and kind of self-liberation in the world. So I think his work had a great empathy with people and with students. Um, the people that worked with him felt that empathy. So we thought it was a good idea to have this kind of open drawing prize where people could make drawings. It's been in different forms during different years. Originally it was kind of more an internal kind of competition where staff would put forward drawings from different courses and then we'd decide on the winner. Um, last year we decided to use an external um, artist, an external person, an artist, Mike Knowles, who lives on Angle Sea, who um, studied with Peter, knew Peter very, very well, um, and so we thought he was an appropriate person to judge the prize. So the prize this year, it's open to all the students in the department, um, there are kind of, you know, small amount of restrictions to do with size, scale, um, but everybody um, can make a drawing, uh, and the drawing you know, can be however you want to define drawing, if you like, because I think Peter was interested in people challenging what drawing is. Um, and all those works will be looked at by Mike Knowles, and eventually he will choose a winner, and there's a small monetary prize, and often a book as well. So I think it's an important thing to do. And, you know, art schools have often had a history of kind of prizes, within the departments. So it's also about being part of a kind of legacy in history, if you like. And I think it's interesting, you know, that we're talking about Peter because we knew him. Um, some of us were taught by him, some of them worked alongside him. And I think it's important for you to realise that you're kind of in an art school and art schools change and eventually the history of art schools are written in the future. And so probably this talk will be a unique afternoon that won't happen again. And it may be that you don't particularly, maybe you're not very interested in painting or you don't particularly have a rapport with landscape. But as art students, potential art students, it's important to see that art schools are a kind of a kind of forum where things happen, things are experimented on, people have an input and an energy into them and they become part of history. And a lot of the students here, you will be going on to degree courses with art schools that'll have their own kind of history or character that may be evolving, that may, that may have changed. Um, and so it will be part of your lives, whichever school you go to, whatever course you do, will be part of a particular moment. And then often these moments are, <coughs> are written about and mapped out later in time. So we felt it was a good idea to do this because some of the experiences we had with Peter, um, you know, when we're not here, won't be available, will they? No, and in a way, you're kind of part of that tradition. We're going to yeah. show some slides now um, which which touch upon this sort of lineage of, of people who taught these. Um, um, so you're part of that progression in a way. You know, you're all here doing design, whatever you're doing, you're painting, sculpture, drawing, etc. Um, and also you talk obviously by your life. You know, we'll talk later on about sketchbooks and much more personal things to do with his family. Um, I think we're, we're all talking from different points of view. James talked by Peter, I talked alongside him. So we're going to get kind of interesting 
kind of things that will come up. We're just going to respond to the slides in different ways so that you get a feel for what he was doing, but maybe pick up on things in terms of his own kind of history, things that hopefully will be relevant to you as potential artists, our students as well. Just about these slides, there are some links in the slides um, which might be a bit slow, okay? So please bear with as we go through. Yesterday it was quite conversational and, um, you know, Darren Hughes, Helen Jones, Owen Prendergast, Manon Aus are here as well. So, if, you know, if you want to contribute, it's not a, a monologue, so I hope it becomes a little bit like that. It was, it was a bit like that yesterday. Um, so I put together a few slides. Um, after, after Emrys wrote the Peace Prendergast Drawing Prize, that brief you've got there, um, I thought about how to communicate that to the students and put together a few slides um, this first one is, is the finished version of the one that you've actually got on that printout that Emrys gave you. Yeah, I can't remember if it's finished. I chose this particular image. I, I don't know if it's a finished version or a version of this in progress. Maybe I want It's in progress. It's in progress. Yeah, the, book. Yeah, the finished one is in the book. So this work, which is a self-portrait, obviously in his studio uh, with a view out, I particularly chose this because I remember he actually was working on it um, kind of round about one summer and he brought it in it's a big work on paper about six foot by six foot and he brought it in and he was still working on it and he kind of we were outside just in the studio down there near outside the door outside the print room and it was on the floor i think it was the end of the year and all the students were gone and he was still working on it and he used to you know we i, I mean i i knew him um kind of from like 1980, I, I wasn't a student of his. I started to teach with him. Before that, we kind of knew each other as artists. So we had a relationship which was both about teaching, friendship, and also kind of a lot of dialogues about painting. So, you know, we kind of compare notes and talk about what we were doing um, quite a lot, really. And so we brought this in, and we were looking at it, and, um, you know, we had a bit of a combative relationship. So he said, what do you think? And I said, well, you know, I don't know really, Peter. I used to wind him up a bit, and he used to wind me up a bit. And so we had this whole discussion about how the space was working. And it was interesting because, um, you know, one of the things that Peter often did, in terms of, like, composition, he'd start kind of drawing somewhere, and then he'd feel he hadn't really dealt with the space, and he'd add another piece of paper on. And then he'd kind of build that out, and we'll see this in, in some of the other works. Um, so I think he, he added a, a bit more paper on it, and then worked on it again. And you can see the final work in the, in the book. So I kind of chose that to go on the kind of leaflet about the prize, simply because I remembered that he was still working on it and still struggling with it. And I think one of the important things to realise, you know, for all artists, is that it is a process and a struggle. And nobody really, you know, making art is not a performance, it's a process. You, you learn through trial and error and adding bits of paper and looking at it and changing it, or whatever your process is. So I thought it was a good image to use for the prize, really, mm -hmm. because it's not, well, look at me, look at me, I'm a great work of art. It's, look at me, I'm something in progress, which is, and I think we thought at this stage, it was too balanced. And it'd be interesting, I can't quite remember to see the final version, but I think it, it became more unbalanced at the end, I don't know, um, do you think it? Yeah, yeah, I know it is. Yeah, it's quite symmetrical. It was it? a bit symmetrical, yeah, and I think that's one of the dialogues that we had about it. And then he, he went back and took it home that summer and worked on it. Mm. You know, and a few times he did work, bring work in, sometimes when the studios were closed, mm. and work on things. I think he, round about, maybe in College Road, when we were over there, around about 1989, I think he brought one of the large landscape paintings that he used to work on. He did, and he finished it. He finished got it. Got postcard done, sent postcard to Frank Carback and told him what you're doing, that's not finished. Right. And the final version is completely different. Yeah. And, uh, but the postcard is halfway yeah. through. Did that go into a show? Was that it went to the to Ag News, didn't it? Yeah. For um, Horizons and the Salt of British Canadian. Okay. Yeah. Um, from yeah. But I, I remember that where the Salt Yeah, I remember that painting he brought it in in three pieces when we were down in College Road, which was when, um, I mean, we were going to talk a bit about the history of how Peter was part of the history of the Foundation course in Bangor. Mm. And we were over in College Road, and he started the Foundation course around about 1980. I only started working at about 89. But he worked with people like Paul Davis, um, uh, 
you know, who was a sculptor and part of the Becker group, the kind of radical group that yeah. often dealt with kind of the whole thing of burning cottages and very political we'll art. We'll touch upon that. Well, yeah, we've got a yeah. few slides later but on. I just, it just reminds me of a funny story. We, we were over there, I think, at the same time. And Paul Davis was kind of a man, he was always doing strange things. He bought, I think there'd been a film in Snowdonia where they used fake rock. So he bought a load of fake boulders. And he, I think he had them stored up in the Yadu, the, the artist and designer's place up in Bethesda. And then he, he was selling them, because this was like the summer. He was selling them, people would put them in the gardens. And uh, somebody, somebody I knew told me a story, they were around at the time. They said, I was driving up in Upper Banga, and I looked out the window, and there was this little old lady in a mini with a huge boulder on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. He took down an Ayak to collect them. Yeah. To collect them, yeah. And then he took a shipment back to college and <laughs> forgot us. Yeah. We, had to, we had to hitch back. Yeah. So we did that now. So it's the most private yeah. yeah. have you? <laughs> <laughs> so we chose, I mean, when you look at that, that portrait there, it's that self portrait, it's a, a head on the figure. And some of these paintings, which, which are always important, and we'll talk about in a bit, I hope, is our heads only. And we've chosen, well they're not heads only, but they're, they're more concentrated on the head and torso, whereas this is a full figure. But we've chosen self-portrait as, as a subject for you because it can be interpreted in so many different ways, partly. Yeah. Partly because you've always got yourself to draw from. You know, if you're ever in doubt about what to draw, you know, lacking in inspiration, um, that is one of... Uh, 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 one way that artists have been able to sort of reignite inspiration is looking and drawing from themselves in the mirror. And it's a very simple and, and well-documented way of working. And it's documented throughout these sketchbooks and throughout books like this. Um, and every fine artist, I think, will have some self-portraits. Yeah, I mean, the history of art is kind of littered with great artists who've made self-portraits. Yeah. Here's one. Yeah, Frank Auerbach, who... I guess we're going to get to talk about now, you know, the, the whole th thing, the few things we do need to talk about in terms of Peter's history is that he was at the, originally uh, was at Cardiff, but then went to Slade School of Art in London um, in the 60s, um, where he encountered uh, Frank Auerbach, who's uh, a very well-known British painter, who's now got a big show on in a big retrospective in the Tate in London. Um, and Auerbach was um, teaching at the Slade at that time, and you know, Peter was taught by him, um, and Peter, you know, um, was influenced by him in, in different ways. I think, and he also kept in contact with him through his life. There are, you know, Auerbach used to write to Peter, and I think um, that's mentioned in a recent book on Auerbach by Catherine Lampert that you know he kept in touch with people like Peter and John Virtue, who's another artist we'll see in a minute. So Auerbach was a working at Slade teaching. And I suppose in terms of my relationship with Peter, I was also at the Slade School of Art like 12 years later. So when I met Peter, um, we kind of had a sort of, a kind of interest in past history. Although I was there at a different time, we both had that experience of being in a school like Slade that was very kind of open and free in one way, but then also had a lot of very strong individuals in it that each would kind of have different ways of working or different philosophies. And one of the things that we talked about yesterday when we gave this talk to another group was how, you know, art schools, particularly in Britain in the 60s, did have very particular schools of um, people working that represented certain things. So that if you went to St. Martin's in the 60s and 70s, you had Anthony Caro who had a sculpture school that was kind of dealt with abstract paint, uh, abstract sculpture. It was quite hard line and kind of quite, um, you know, you couldn't, you know, they weren't particularly liberal in, in terms of environments in some ways. Mm. So it's kind of interesting to think about that. Well, it's also interesting from, from a kind of, this is my special, um, yeah. special torch, okay, um, to read a passage from this book. This is a book which was published only not that long ago, was it? Oh, two years two ago. Two years ago by Richard. Richard, Richard Paul wrote the essay. Yeah. Um, and it, it documents <coughs> three different passages from this throughout this talk. Um, and one of them, I love this talk, is about Peter arriving in London 
from Glamorgan, from Cardiff, uh, which is that, oh, I love this torch, which is this sketchbook here. Okay, so he's a foundation student of Cardiff from the Welsh Valley, South Wales, young man, very robust, enigmatic, characterful, dynamic, who goes to London. Um, and I'm just going to read a section from this because it sounded like he was sort of landing <coughs> in the yeah. quite, a, quite a sort of daunting prospect. Okay, so this is, we're talking about young Prendergast. Soon after one of Prendergast's Cardiff tutors had shown his work to Geoffrey Camp, a visiting tutor from the Slade School of Fine Art in London, the idea of applying for a place there became inescapable. Interviewed in 1964 by a severe panel, including the Slade's principal, William Coldstream, Prendergast proved impressive. He told them how much the work of Bacon and de Kooning fascinated him. Coldstream warmed in particular to a drawing of the Welsh rugby player Vivian Jenkins, whom he had befriended during his army days. He was also in favour of positive discrimination, selecting students from working class and emigre backgrounds who lacked orthodox academic qualifications. So Prendergast was offered a place which he took up in October 1965. Among his fellow students were Timothy Hyman, Derek Jarman and John Virtue. At the outset, the 17-year-old student felt very disconcerted. And then I'm going to do a read a quote by of his now. The class difference became evident. I was from a coal mining family, and we didn't have a book in the house, and there were a lot of very well-educated students at the Slade. They came from good schools, not from the roughest school in Glamorgan. They were sophisticated. I probably feared them at first. I found it difficult to make friends there, and it took me a long time to get adjusted. I think that whole thing of like the Slade as a sort of place where you have these kind of interesting artists, but you kind of arrived there and you know there wasn't a lot of teaching necessarily. It was kind of like you you go on with it and then yeah. you would get feedback from people, but it was very much sink or swim, mm -hmm. and, and you did have a mix. I mean, when I was there, there was like Celia Hall, who was eventually with Lucian Freud. She was like the daughter of a bishop. There was Sarah Raphael, who was Frederick Raphael. Playwright's uh, mm. daughter, you know, who looked like she just walked out of the Chelsea program, you know. Mm. Um, and then there was, you know, the people like me that, you know, from Liverpool, and, uh, you know, it, it was a real mix, and you, you just sort of got on with it, really. Um, and some people, like a friend of mine, his brother, went there, he almost had a breakdown there because there was no, there was no real kind of direction. I think it depended on where you were, because it's only when I was a slave, there was different studios in different parts of the building. So there, there was like Stuart Brisley, who was an experimental artist, who was downstairs when I was there. There was Mick Moon and John Hoyland went upstairs. Way upstairs there was the old traditional studios, that probably where Peter was originally, that was like Coldstream, who was still there, William Coldstream that you mentioned, Patrick George, Yuan Uglo. Yeah. And then, you know, a lot of People that seemed to go up, they were quite introverted, from what I remember. And they'd go up for like three years, four years. <laughs> go to the attic. Yeah, and, then, and they'd have poses that last like three months, you know. And they kind of, the windows would be open in the summer and pigeons would fly in and fly out again. But they didn't draw quick enough to get the pigeon to <laughs> measure in, you know. Mm. So it was kind of like there was different camps, really. Yeah. Different places, you know. And we've got a few slides here just that kind of encapsulate, perhaps, um, for me, that, that kind of idea of a 1960s artist, but this is before the night, probably before yeah. around that time. Yeah. This is a, an image, a photograph of Leo Kossoff um, in the studio, um, who was a student with Auerbach. So, you know, you've got that generation before Peter, people like this, who were then teaching him. Um, so this, you can see from this image this kind of very... Um, well, it's quite a striking image, isn't it, of a young man in, in black, surrounded by paint, and a very sort of meaty paint at that, you know, there's no, there's no kind of clean walls or, you know, it's a work in progress, the whole thing, it's very much about the act of, of yeah. painting, I think. You know, yeah, I mean, we sort of doubt. got on to kind of talking about yesterday about the, this whole thing of, like, our back and, you know, this idea of lineage in art where somebody you know influences somebody else i think there's a handshake game where you if you shake somebody's hand and they knew somebody else and you they shook somebody up how far you can get back in time you can often get back quite quickly to somebody quite important you know but in terms of like if you look at 
the situation in the 60s like where you've got Auerbach teaching. Um, he'd been influenced by David Holmberg, who'd been working in the 40s, yeah. He was a really important British artist who started off painting kind of very large scale, quite powerful, almost like vorticist uh, geometric paintings. But then began to develop a new way of working from observation, which was very kind of physical and intuitive, and had um, drawing classes and painting classes. He was in the Florida Institute in London. Um, and while Auerbach um, and uh, Kossoff were, I think, at the Royal College, they also went to these um, classes at Bomberg as well. Um, and were introduced with a, to a much more kind of physical way of painting from the model. Um, but then Auerbach himself and that whole generation you mentioned, Bacon and Freud, mm -hmm. had actually been really influenced by what had been going on in Paris in like the 50s. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when Bacon was around in the 60s, late 50s uh, and Freud was around, they visited Paris and they met Giacometti <coughs> and Picasso. And so all those artists, particularly I think Auerbach, uh, Freud, and I guess Bacon, they were kind of really taken by Giacometti's work. You know, Giacometti worked in a tiny studio with bare walls and he would draw on the walls figures. He worked largely from his own family, his brother and his, his wife Annette, I think it was. And he also worked from a few quite well-known people like Jean Genet, um, Sartre, who was a philosopher, existentialist philosopher, who wrote about, about Giacometti. So that period in the 50s, 60s in Paris influenced Bacon, it influenced Auerbach and Freud. And also there's a critical David Sylvester who wrote uh, a lot about all of those artists and also interviewed Bacon. He visited Giacometti in Paris and then he brought him over in the 70s to talk in, in London. So this group of artists who really began to get interested in making art from observation largely that was kind of almost like this sort of existential situation of like being in a room with somebody, looking at them again and again, inquiring about what you're seeing in a kind of profound, continually, almost obsessive way. Yeah. And through this process, you come up with, with, with something which is kind of magical and unique. But the essential thing was it, it had to be authentic and there was no real formula <laughs> for it. It was learning through experience. And certainly Auerbach, and then also Peter, would often talk about the need to go beyond words. You know, I think that's how it fitted in with kind of this kind of existential philosophy, that we, we sense the world through our bodies and our senses like sight, sound and so on, feeling, touch. Mm -hmm. And certainly Auerbach's painting and Bomberg's painting was influenced by the idea of, of, of the tactile and the haptic, what, what it's like to touch things. Things you know, if you touch something in the dark, how does that feel? So it wasn't just about how things looked; it was about getting something that was essential. And they saw this as a kind of um, almost like an existential truth that they were after. It wasn't about making paintings. The idea that they were making paintings was kind of a bit anathema to them. It wasn't about making something decorative that go on the wall. You were actually trying to make something that was so kind of almost came out of the depths of somewhere. And I think that's why, you know, Bomberg, who worked again from the, the same spaces in London, in Whitechapel, Auerbach, who worked in Camden Town continually and still does, mm -hmm. and into present, you know, that was incredibly powerful as a, a kind of what was eventually called the School of London. And clearly in, in Peter's uh, work, we get this sort of um, interest and obsession with hard work and industry, mm. but also going to the same kinds of places, mm. working from the same kinds of forms. And you know, he, he did talk a lot about his early life in Abitidu and you know, playing outside on the hillside and that kind of very personal sensation of working and being in the landscape. And going beyond the obvious. And going beyond the obvious. Beyond the surface. Yeah, so that by, by drawing and continually questioning, um, and, and trying to get beyond anything that might be kind of designed or illustrative. Yeah. illustrative. You get to something more, more profound and more felt. Yeah. And often it was in a state of, you'd only get there maybe in a state of exhaustion. 
Yeah, well, there's a little that, but that second reading I'll do touches upon that. Yeah. I'm just going to mention these few slides. I've switched through quite quickly here, just so to name check really. Um, I'll put this slideshow on move or send it to Owen or whatever. Um, Stanley Spencer, who was a contemporary Bomberg. So again, just looking at that lineage of Auerbach and Bomberg and Spencer. Um, and then there's a couldn't not put this in. He was talking to Darren in the in, yeah. the, in the office, and I was putting this together. And um, this is an image of Stanley Spencer, double portrait of himself and his second wife, and uh, the leg of mutton, as it's called. This very analytical, almost cruel in a way, um, but certainly very analytical painting of the figure um, using, you know, using those greens within the skin tones and purples and greys, and you know, thinking of going. You know, thinking of the figure as a sort of lump of meat or yeah. it's so objective it, it goes beyond that kind of Yeah, this is a big paint, it's in the tape and it's, um, you know, it's got a kind of, I mean, I think Freud in his painting talked about even the hair that you saw as a kind of limb rather than that, you know, it's that idea yeah. that you're so objective that you. You know, and when you, when you, well, talk about teaching life drawing a bit, but there's, there's you and, oh, well, I never know how to do You've got, yeah. Learned. Yeah, he, he was he was a sort of slave when I was there. He was a teacher, and so this was this school of what was called the Euston Road School. Originally, Coldstream started. It was very analytical to do with almost a kind of mapping out of space using you know very precise measurements and measuring. And it kind of come from Cezanne, really. I think mm. this line. But it, again, it, it was partly influenced by by Jack and Messi. So just looking at some of those people around at the same time. We mentioned, uh, you know, there's Lucy and Freud and John Virtue. Um, we're going to come then away from London and uh, when Peter moved to Wales. Um, and we're going to look at a clip in a moment um, of, of some work that's surrounding this painting, which is probably <coughs> one of the better knowns Better known paintings of Peter Pope. Yeah. So he was a landscape painter. Yeah. Um, it's a kind of iconic piece, I think. And it was, I guess I saw it the first, when I first met him around about 1980. It was in a big show, one of the big shows he had, I think it was maybe in 83, at Austin Gallery. And there was this big painting, which is about seven foot by seven foot, something like that, and a lot of quite important drawings, which again, where he'd, he'd added um, kind of sections to the drawing. And he, he talked about <coughs> how he was feeling, you know, there was, I think there was an interview that he made at the time on an audio at the gallery when I saw that show, and he, he talked, it was all about, you know, the challenge of painting the quarry, and when he looked in it, you know, he began to saw it, see a bit, but the actual dealing with the space really involved gradually enlarging everything. So this was in a no number of sections, and it, it's a, I mean, the other thing that this makes makes me think about is that Peter did talk about when he was at school um, you know, and, and kind of um, being really influenced by his teacher uh, who did paint in the classroom and introduced him to people like Rouault the painter, mm -hmm. you know, the, the painter that painted very kind of stained glass window-like um, paintings, often of religious uh, subjects, very powerful physical things with colour within and I think you can see and feel that kind of original influence maybe in this piece. So this is called Bethesda Quarry, painted in 1980. By the time the artist Peter Prendergast came to the same area 140 years later, the slate industry was a shadow of its former self, but the quarry still retained its capacity to inspire painters. I think the people that worked in this quarry behind you, they've dug it, they've carved it, they've looked after it. What is a greater monument than that quarry? What piece of sculpture? would be greater than that. Penlin Quarry became one of the big subjects of his life. His work was very expressionist and some people call it cubist. He used a lot of black to surround the blocks of colour that he used to show the, this the slate outcrops. Um, here's all the ways the sunlight hit the slate, the reflections in the rain. He saw blues, he saw yellows, he saw orange. He saw the quarries in a way that the average person wouldn't see and brought them alive in a way that an artist could. As well as painting the quarry,
Prendergast was also interested in the surrounding countryside and applied the same geometric patterns to these fields. He was unusual that he didn't picture people in his landscape. I can't recall a picture that shows um, a person, although there were people about. It wasn't what he was interested in, it was the form of the land and the land's effect on the landscape that interested him and what drove him to paint. So that brings us up to sort of early 1980s where he's living with his young family um, in Daniole and he's teaching in Liverpool. This is a, um, a self-portrait by Mike Knowles who was a contemporary of Peter's. He was at Slade with him and he was head of school at Liverpool. And, um, He's the guy who's the judge in the drawing. He's the guy who's the judge in the drawing. So he'll be coming along to look at all these, all these drawings. Yeah. I'm just going to read you a, a little, a little also snapshot. They're the next door neighbours okay. as well. That's right. Yeah. They're in the middle of nowhere. You know, yeah. Dad had bought a cottage in the middle of nowhere. He was teaching Liverpool. He told Mike about this wonderful place that he was living. Two weeks later, there was a removal of land coming up the road. And it was his colleague from Liverpool. This was a doctor, <laughs> Fezda, in Gerland. Can you imagine how sort of close a comfort for that and, was? And, uh, I think yesterday I told a story is that when um, Paul Davis arrives and rents the caravan. Well, that was when we lived down in Bethesda. Okay, rents the caravan. So we it down. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, yeah, that was so the so story. That's a theme story yeah, when yeah, it, so he, he was renting it and he burnt it down. He, yeah, he by accident. It, but I, I hope it was by accident. Yeah. Though, the morning after it burnt down, there's most of yeah, Mum and Dad didn't have much money, yeah. so they had the house that was too big. Sorry, but it's in the no, 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 theme no, no, room, no, no. having enough money. Oh, yeah. So they, they bought a caravan, put it in the garden, yeah. rented it out to students during, yeah. the, during the winter, and we lived in it in the summer, so the house was going to bed, bed and breakfast. Yeah. Paul happened to rent it whilst he was teaching on foundation. The caravan burned down, and my mother and father said, oh, Christ, what are we going to do for money? And Paul was rummaging in the in the rector, this is marvellous, and there's a piece of sculpture that's been made, the scissors are melted into this plant. That's the basic schedule, didn't they? He did, yeah. That's the way it was, folks. So he's going back to the forest to Liverpool, often with Mike Mills, isn't he? Sharing yeah, yeah. It. But it's not always a, it's not a cosy relationship, you know, these artists, when they're um, working together and teaching together, it's not all nice as pie necessarily all the time. You know, it's it's quite an ambitious thing to be a painter, as you know. Didn't, um, didn't John Birch turn up there and get a job there? Wasn't that, was he involved in it? I believe so. I yeah, there so was some, some I remember Peter talking about it. Wasn't Peter was going to the same job? Yeah, maybe it was that, yeah. So, yeah. So he gets a part time job in Liverpool. I'll read you this bit. Um, and he's got this strong, you know, you can see the sort of paintings that he's making, these very sort of large scale oil paintings. You know, there's a lot of effort involved, you know, in, in making something at that scale. So, Prendergast encountered resistance from some students within Liverpool College of Art to his emphasis on hard work, regular attendance, and sustained application for lengthy periods of time. The most revealing observations he wrote in his teaching notes focus on the importance of striving to make a personal statement. Prendergast passionately believed that talent should be pushed to the limit, for it is when the brain is working at maximum that one begins to create and to use the talent in a controlled way. His love of sport helped him to bolster this argument, referring to Herb Elliott, who had broken the world record for running the fastest mile, who pointed out that exhaustion would make Elliott run faster. Scorning the notion that art should allow the practitioner <coughs> to relax, Prendergast argued that paintings can be made out of anger and dislike. He conveyed his own commitment to extreme endeavour by describing how, in making art, it should be as if your nerves are really tingling and as if you are walking a tightrope. Then, addressing himself to anxious students who might feel frightened by such advice, he pointed out that, if you climb a mountain and push yourself really hard to climb a different part, you could fall off and get killed. If you push yourself really hard in painting, the most you will be is depressed. <laughs> like Bomberg before him, Prendergast drew inspiration from the Russian ballet, and he quoted Rudolf Nureyev's confession that, after practicing all day, I am shattered, 
but I reckon my final piece would be best, because when I am tired, I produce only the movements that are necessary. And I think that kind of, probably for me, sort of sums up, you know, when I'm thinking about him talking like that, you know, that energy and that commitment, I think probably a lot of ex-students can remember that as, as a sort of legacy in a way, that sort of work ethic that you described, you know, that terribly, um, you, know, you can probably see it in me when I'm talking about it, you know, it's this kind of uh, sort of angst almost and a sort of energy and a push for something. Um, I think it was going, always going beyond the superficial, wasn't it? Always so within superficial. drawing, you, you might have had a drawing that kind of looked all right, but... Rub it out, you know, rub that bit question out. Question it. You know, question it and to look again. And he believed that, or he taught us, that to look and to keep on looking and to look be, be, beneath the obvious on something. You know, in school, when you're in primary school, and you use that peach-coloured or skin-coloured paint for skin. You know, to look beyond that and to see the colour within things and to see the structure, the underlying structure beneath the surface form. So those are the sort of things that he was talking about. And he talked about them so um, passionately, I suppose, and with such vigour yeah. and conviction that you, you did what he was asking you to do because, I, you know, because you had respect for him as an artist. You know, it's, it's, um, I think that's a really important thing, isn't it? If you see your teacher mm -hmm. making artwork or you know that he or she means it, I think it gives you yeah, I think, belief. I think art schools generally have been about people embodying what they're, what, what they're talking about. And often yeah. that's sort of almost like a felt thing rather than a visual thing, isn't it? Um, and so I had, I'll give you a little potted history, okay? I did a, I didn't get on very well with school, that's the most synopsis version of it, and I did a national diploma which still runs the BTEC, and I did the first year and I was 16 living in a bed sitting banger and not eating, you know, going off the rails, well off the rails, and I took a year out and I went abroad and worked and went to Manchester and stuff and worked. And when I came back, the second year of the National Diploma of Tech was forged with a foundation. So when I came back, I knew that I wanted and needed to do art and design. And I had this kind of um, seriousness about it, which I hadn't had when I was 16. Um, but at 18, I took it very seriously, as you can see, you know, serious young woman here, cold, in a bedroom, <coughs> drawing. Um, and that to me, I was saying yesterday, um, I had loads of sketchbooks, you know, like prolific. You worked all the time, you worked in the evening, you know, you made the sketchbooks, you made drawings, and you'd bring them in and you'd get critique, and you'd go back and you'd work back into it so that the paper began to wear away, you know, and you really got into it. Um, and it's one thing, I've burnt all the sketchbooks, but it's one drawing that I kept and I will still keep because it reminds me of me at 18 and it throws up a whole load of stuff actually and it's, it's quite, now at this age, it's quite interesting looking at a younger self and seeing something hopefully, well certainly for me, beyond the superficial, you know. Um, so, so that's... But he, when he said, he, he'd say, you know, you're going to go home this weekend, you're going to do sick, well, you would say it like that, say, you know, go home, you're going to spend 16 hours this weekend on your drawing. And I would, I would sit and I would draw for 16 hours over the weekend. And that's not uncommon, you know, if you talk to people like Darren. I am not sure I've seen that. He's in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you and when Harry, a whole, there's a whole generation <coughs> You know, of people like Eleni Jones, yeah. um, artists and makers who who may not have ended up painting necessarily, not what Eleni Jones does, but who had that kind of drumming in of this kind of ethic, and and um, it helped me. I didn't become a painter or a sculptor. I studied at Liverpool. Um, and Mike Knowles was head of school at Liverpool. Um, 
so I phoned that founder, I went to the people to find out, but I ended up doing book design, so graphic design, computer, desktop publishing, and <coughs> come in. so I ended up moving from fine art to book design. Um, but that attention to detail, that, that kind of ethic, yeah, and that kind of drawing creates a, almost like an unconscious structure, doesn't it, that you can, and a rigour. A rigour. Yeah. Yeah. And when you do other things like design or organising something, you've got that, you've kind of felt that. And I think a lot of the thing about our background piece is like you're internalising things through, doing, through, through making. And trained you to see, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. As, as a kid driving around, it might sound like a small little aside, but he would always be the first person to spot a hair in the far corner mm. of the field, yeah. or a buzzard, or a particular bird, or something. Mm. Yeah. And I'm convinced mm. it was because he, yeah, through, through drawing out. every single day, constantly, yeah. it's, it's training your eyes, and you see yeah. things, don't you? But not only that, seeing things differently, yeah. explaining things, describing and he, 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 of life. He often so. said to me, you know, when he was starting off the, about drawing, that he always wanted to draw every blade of grass, he was drawing a field. And I think that was interesting in his work because there was this obsessive obsession to detail as well as this kind of more expressive kind of mark making um, that kind of came together almost. Mm. Yeah, he'd also show the students those beautiful Van Gogh yeah. where there are almost every every, every right. everything, yeah, yeah. He often said he, he, he wanted to, to do illustration in a way. And it's kind of interesting the way artists, I mean particularly Van Gogh, I think Van Gogh was quite kind of cat-handed when he started out. He was a classic case of somebody who, through industry, learn and develop his work. And I think generally artists start with their weaknesses and kind of traverse them almost through using them. You know, I think uh, you know, certainly Van Gogh was a good, good model in that way. I think you know Peter talked a lot about Van Gogh and, and also Rembrandt when we went to London going and seeing the Rembrandts in the National Gallery was for him, you know, one of the most important things in terms of what you could look at really. So this is work by Morris, isn't it? Oh yeah, but I was just going to say, um, no, hang on. Um, you know, I didn't want to draw every blade of grass and I didn't want to draw every part of my hair, you know, and I think um, it was a struggle, yeah. wasn't it actually? I mean, and yeah. I think, um, <coughs> You know, drawing from drawing from photographs is quite interesting because I, I did a lot of that. And I, before digital cameras, you know, before the internet, in the olden days, you know, those sort of things. And I'd get negative films and draw on top of them with felt tip and things like that, experimental. Um, and they would say to me, oh, you know, don't draw from photographs. Dolan Hughes, who's now who teach taught print here, who's now director of Kumi now, isn't he? Um, would say, oh, you know, you mustn't draw from, from photographs, and I couldn't understand why. And then I realised that it's it's putting a barrier between you and the thing that you're drawing in a way. I mean, you can use photographs, and I yeah, and do, I, I think you know, exactly. certainly Peter, he had a particular way of, of working, didn't he? Yeah. And you know, he was very forceful with that. Yeah. Uh, as other artists are often forceful in other ways, and it became. You know, a certain kind of philosophical thing going on in the early days. I think, as he, for me, as he got older, he changed quite a lot yeah. in terms of his attitude to other artists and the artists that he looked at. And I think he became more, maybe a bit more liberal, you know, from when I first met him. And I think often the case when artists are young, they're having to establish something for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And then as they get older, they're maybe their perception changes or they. You know, and I, but I think, as we'll see later on, I think the work changed as well because I do think that the early work was very much um, linked with the drawing ethic and mm. the structural lines that mm. you know that we saw in the quarry painting. And then we, when we see the later work where he begins to use colour in a different kind of way in the big works on paper and acrylic, it changed. And I think the way he talked about artists changed. That you know. Early, earlier on, he would talk about Cornish painters like Peter Lanyon, who he respected, but you know, people like Patrick Heron, he didn't seem to, mm. when he was young. Later on, I think he, he began to talk about making work that was more like a symphony or a piece of music, which I've not really heard him say when he was you know, in those forms mm. at the time. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned, you, this is a piece of work by Maurice Cockrell, who was, a, again, a contemporary of Peter's. I think they met in Reading. 
Um, and after he'd done his, presumably doing teacher training, wasn't it, Reddy? No, the master MA. Was it master? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, it was the first master. There was Morris. Right. Yeah. Right. There was also Mally Morris, the painter, who was there that right. year. And Stephen Buckley, who was a big painter in the 80s, who still works. So I think in Reading, he had very different kinds of people, didn't he? Yeah. I think you, you had a, they pretty much had a house in Reading, which they all house, yeah. worked in. And they could choose a lecturer who visited them once a month. And it was Frank Arbath who used to visit right. my dad once a month. Right. Yeah. Uh, other students had other artists from art colleges all over the country yeah. coming yeah. visiting them. So they basically lived together, almost like a commune working, as I understand it. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a large scale painting. I, can't, I don't know the dimensions, I think it's big, probably not far off the size of that, that wall. Uh, Maurice Cockrell happens to be my uncle, so I would talk, and I was at Liverpool, and Maurice was very. was. He wasn't from Liverpool, but it was very much part of that era yeah. in Liverpool, like the scaffold and Roger McGrath. Yeah. There was a whole scene, I mean, I, when I was in, you know, the reason I was from Liverpool, I used, to, I used to go and see shows at the Walker in, must have been like, I don't know, uh, when I was at school, like, the, like 1975, 74, mm -hmm. 75. So this whole school of people, like Adrian Henry, who was a poet, mm -hmm. who knew Roger McGrath. And there was a thing called the Liberal, Liverpool Academy that included Morris and John Ball, who now serves oh, yeah. on Anglesey. Yeah. And they showed, you know, in shows, and it was a period, uh, a lot of painters were painting in a kind of photorealist way, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, like the Americans did. Um, and I think at that point, um, I think uh, Morris did have a big kind of photorealist painting. Yeah, we well, did a lot of that work. Yeah, I think that period, really and then it evolved and changed. And this is very obviously an abstract um, it's a later piece, painting, right? a later piece, yeah, sort of almost like a stencil. So Morris was keeper of the Royal Academy schools in London, and um, I was talking yesterday a little bit about the grandiosity of some of these things, you know, the sort of grandeur of these um, paintings and the, and the places in which they're made. So as keeper of the school, he would have, he took me into the studio once in that beautiful part of London, or just next to the Mall, and, and there's the studio next to where the students have their studio. Um, you know, a very privileged kind of, you know, these were young men, Morris's background was from steelworks in Bromborough. You know, these are young, you know, Morris's background is very kind of, I won't go into it here, but you know, it's not necessarily a middle class background, and they've worked very hard to get to these positions, reasonably establishing positions, really, in things like the Royal Academy. So, so that was the kind of Liverpool connection, and and um, and I came went from Liverpool to London and worked at the BBC for a while before coming back as a book designer, before coming back to Wales. And I approached the college to do some teaching because I was fed up going backwards and forwards to London. And I came into college here, and um, there was Peter, who I hadn't seen, and you and Gwyn Carey, who I hadn't seen since I was about 17, and I met Owen, and started teaching on the foundation course a couple of days a week while having my own book design practice as well. Um, so we would talk, when, when I, yeah, I, I was very fortunate in that my first year of teaching foundation, you know, fantastic course, huge groups of students, and it was quite intimidating the first, um, the first couple of months, I suppose, and, and I was very lucky in that Peter was very, he was teaching on the course, and I was helped in my teaching by him, really, and I sort of learned a lot from looking at how he spoke to students and, and helped students. I think one of the things um, that I valued most about it was his, his belief in students, his generosity with students. Um, I think that goes a very long way in terms of self-belief, because usually artists and designers are quite sensitive people and don't always have the biggest confidence, <laughs> uh, the greatest confidence, and support that you get of people that you respect and admire means a huge amount. Um, so, so there's a couple of slides here of, of later work. Everest mentioned the work changing and, and Peter's attitude to artists as well. So began to, the conversation
same yeah. began to get different, didn't they? Yeah, I and felt that he kind of got into later on, he began to work a lot on paper with yeah. the acrylic. I yeah. remember there was a particular period which was quite interesting, uh, which I remember, where he, he had this beginning to develop this relationship with Agnews in London, where he eventually did have a big show. Well, and this here, which, yeah. um, which Owen, you picked up. Whenever that was, because it's bilingual. You no, know, I noticed that the first time mm -hmm. yesterday. I thought that was quite Change. unusual for Agnew to have was there any length of the. the uh, Agnew is a very, is a very, I thought the oldest gallery, commercial galleries in London, isn't it? Yeah, they have like all this Italian art. It was 10, ten, ten years ago, no, 50 years ago, we took some students along and had a look at one of his paintings, and they actually wouldn't have let us in. It's a lot. He said, Tutor, he painted it. Oh, yeah. Just about let us in. Yeah, and there's a the whole, there's right whole thing where Peter went, eventually went to New York. Peter hate, was scared of flying, wasn't he? And I think yes. one of the portraits is called Scared of Flying. He was going fear to be accused of fear of flying. He was due to go to Texas. I think this was in the 80s. And he, he, he went to a. He tried to get hypnotized, I think. He tried all sorts. It was went down and I was yeah. scared. He tried all sorts. And, 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 and we spent weeks in the staff room and he was talking about it. And he went to it and then eventually he never went. He, didn't, he decided the day before he wasn't going. I think it was a show in Texas and then he didn't go. So then he had this opportunity to go uh, to New York with um, uh, what's his name? Len, Len Tavner, who was a, again a friend of his, a painter. And there was some story that they, they went to New York and I think there was somebody from Agnews that had a flat in, in a, it was a penthouse or something. And was there some whole thing that they had a card to get in or something? Yeah, and they, 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 they were phoned and they yeah. were in this flat. Yeah. I don't know, New York. And they were asked if they would be there because a the painting needed to be delivered. Right. And they said, oh, that's okay. We, yeah. we can put the painting. said, well, would you recognise a constable? <laughs> and uh, yes. Why is a constable, John Constable, being delivered? So well, okay. they, thought, they thought it was a joke. Yeah. And then half an hour later, there's a phone call from the reception. There's a painting leaning against the wall. An Airbnb acting style. It's a John Constable. <laughs> and they took it upstairs and wrapped it on the neck. <laughs> and then he made those in the, one of the books as the drawings he made uh, looking into New York buildings and so on. Um, so, yeah. so these are some later later works on paper which are very fluid, very beautiful yeah. paintings. There's a book here which I'm reading from which has got loads of these. You know, these are just tiny, tiny fragments from the whole. Um, but I'm going to read a, a passage that goes goes along with these. So these are painted sort of round about sort of 2000s, isn't it, now? Yeah. During the latter half of the 1990s, he focused on the view from his studio at Daniolen. It was so absorbing and ever-changing that he rarely strayed far from home. There was no need to. Each successive day seemed to trigger fresh insights into the dramatic locations around him, from Snowdonia down to the Menai Straits. The act of looking was, for, Peter, for Prendergast, tantamount to a revelation. By a paradox, the more he stared outwards, the more he unlocked the creative turmoil within him. That is why he was willing in 1996 to chart every stage of a storm's progress over Daniola, from the lightning flashes igniting the distant sea to the moment when the entire village was engulfed in wind and rain. Prendergast did not respond to well-behaved weather for painting. It bored him, whereas the endemic instability of the Welsh climate impelled him to leave the studio and feel the full impact of a gale on his body. Out there, he became fully alive, and his fortuitous discovery of acrylics in 1993 meant that for the rest of the decade and beyond, he could paint direct from the motif, rather than limiting himself to drawing in the landscape and then producing oil paintings back in the studio. The emancipatory effect of acrylic prompted Prendergast to feel that he had recovered painting. I'm going to read just a short quote from Peter. With all the direct confidence that you have when just emerging from art school, it is a confidence that working in the provinces can ebb away. I feel it in my bones that I'm just beginning to get back to that point at 46. I feel that if I've got this far, maybe I do have something to say. But then that is not the driving force of painting. The driving force is that, above all else, you need to do it to keep your feet on the ground and to give understanding to your own life. Yeah, so I think he, you know, he began to have, he had this late, great period, really, didn't yeah. he? From 
that point into the paintings we see later on when he was, he was doing a big show at Oriel Morn, all that part of his life in Plangevny. And he began to make these paintings of Anglesey, often in acrylic, um, you know, that have got an incredible sense of light and space and atmosphere and fluidity. I mean, this one, again, is of the kind of classic Prendergast format of like four or five foot by eight or ten foot long that work on paper. And when you see this in real life, you know, the, if you think of the scale, it is as, as long as the wall, really. So the kind of, the kind of fluidity of the acrylic and the, the way the sea is painted, they're, they're really quite spectacular things. That, yeah. You know, I mean, kind of this like is in the... Lake Titian or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? As you say, that one sort of is a late masterpiece yeah. in the National yeah. Museum, yeah. Cardiff. Right, yeah. um, again, I don't know the dimensions, but it's it's an immersive painting. If you stand in front of it, it is. It stands up there with, with some of the, the great artists, you know, people like Rothko or yeah. Titian, you mentioned. Yeah. Um, I'm think, gonna, sorry. Yeah, I think, I think some of the, you know, of that period, there's some fantastic paintings that, in terms of their colour, are extraordinary, and the use of light and gesture, yeah. where it's almost like he, yeah, he kind of went full circle in some kind of way. Yeah. I just flick over to the other side. I'll just go through them very quickly, just to put so you've got the full picture. So, when Peter became, um, he started teaching on the BA. Fine art course here it was set up with Helen and Emrys. Well, with Emrys initially. With Emrys initially. In. And there's a very special photograph that we'll make sure that we find of that <laughs> video. Um, so I was teaching alongside him, and then when he became ill, he, I was asked to cover a class of his, and um, a BA first year class, which I did. And this is just a sketch that I made while the students were busy drawing. It's a, of a model called Len. Les. Les. And um, I was quite nervous about doing this class because I was very conscious that it was his class and um, I did it for, I can't remember how many weeks, five or six weeks or something. And then when he was better and he came back to college, I passed him in the corridor and he said, um, good colour. <laughs> and I was like, oh wow. You know, it was it meant so much from somebody like that. Um, and this is just, as I say, just a little quick sketch, but I wanted to put something on there because as I was putting this slideshow together, I was conscious of my own responses as a young woman then, and as an old woman now, but of my own responses to this, um, to the influence of the male artist in my own life. So I wanted to put something on there that, that was a drawing of Les, who's a wonderful model, but it, it's, it was different, it was looking at the male, sort of, sort of reflect more objectively. And while I was teaching, uh, teaching students in the life room, we were looking at, you know, people like uh, Rembrandt and mm. Ongre and, yeah. you know, all those, Lucian Freud, Jenny Savile, who you've got here, um, Freud, who you've got there, you know, these fantastic painters as well as people who approach life drawing in a different way, not necessarily straightforward academic drafts people, you know, who can make a picture that looks, you know, that's supposed to be the standard, isn't it, of a, of a good drawing, something that looks like the thing you're drawing in, in three dimensions, but people that are approaching it in a different way, so we were working with students that were responding through stitch or through uh, materials in different ways. And, a couple of pieces of work here by Tracy Emin and David Shrigley, which kind of encapsulate that different approach to, to drawing, that it, that it wasn't necessarily all labour in, in that kind of um, physical way, that some things were, were different, were produced differently. Um, so I just wanted to touch upon that a little bit. We talked about this painting. Um, towards the end of Peter's life in 2007. And Peter died very suddenly and it was a, a massive shock. Um, and the prize was set up uh, very quickly after his death as a, as a collective response. Um, and the, the obituaries in major uh, British newspapers um, and the Victoria Committee was put up in the Thames mm. when we went. Yeah, we were on a London trip, yeah. And uh, I think it was 
was on his birthday, or was it a year after his, uh, just after he died, but I can't remember, yeah, maybe the following year. But there was uh, flowers, and it was upstairs, the big quarry painting, in the take. And it looked, um, it was incredible to see it outside of Wales, because it looked so much like a fantastic European painting that you could put with, you know, um, you know all the kind of, you know, Picasso or a, mm. a Brac, or it seemed very Held its own. complete. Yeah, yeah, it was very. It, I mean, it's strange the way that your perception of paintings changes where they are, but there was something about it that you kind of felt well. He really did it. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and that's what we're talking about him today, yeah. that he really did do it. And, he did um, do it, yeah. Um, and it wasn't easy, but he did it. Yeah. Because we saw him struggling yeah. on a daily basis. Well, I was talking to Manon before about you know, that, that um, you know, to be a great painter, to yeah. want to be a great painter is a hell of a thing to want to be, and this sort of set of attributes you need to get there, I think. I mean, he must have that, that determination to, to yeah. do it, you know, it wasn't easy, was it? Since Schoenberg, the composer, said that the middle road is the only road that never leads to Rome. You know, I think he went for it, didn't he? And yeah. Peter always talked about the rejection, the rejection draw. Yeah, yeah, to be an artist, you know, you've the got a big draw. The draw of rejections, with, and how you have to cope with that. How things have to work, yeah. You have a lot of rejection. You had to bounce back up very quickly. In the, in the film that we're unable to watch because we can't get it to work, there's a bit where he talked about the quarry painting in a hard one image. Yeah. And he went down to the opening with my mother and drank champagne, pulled yeah. it up, and he was in a room with bacon and hot sauce yeah. and Arbac and Bomberg. And he got home the following morning and it was the observer, which always got in. Yeah. Opened it, review section, the hard one image. Mm. Pages of it read down through it through it, saw his name, great as the central room mm. with Bomberg and uh, our back, etc. Looks wonderful. It's a shame it's ruined by the chaotic quarry painting by Prendergast. Or some words along those lines, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's in that little film. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll find a way to play yeah. it sometime. It's yeah. quite well. But yeah, but what to do? You have to get, up to get and carry on. on. Carry on yeah. Yeah. I think that's what we'll, like, we'll talk briefly after about the sketchbooks. I think it's easy to put people on pedestals. Um, this is a normal person who failed his 11 plus, who went to the secondary modern school, who was destined to go down a coal mine, mm. who didn't feel particularly great about himself, thought he couldn't write properly, was orphaned mathematics, and wasn't a natural draftsman, was he? No, he no. did struggle with what yeah. he did, but through you know, the industry, you talk about maybe that came from his background of growing up in an area dominated by heavy industry and the work that they had there. But through hard work, determination, and grit, which is evident in the sketchbooks, you actually can get somewhere. That should give, it shouldn't intimidate people. Hopefully, this inspires people. There. <coughs> and the, 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 the sketchbook, which was when he was on a foundation course, was quite amazing to see when he's you know, a student in Cardiff and starting out. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at those. Yeah. We'll, we'll turn these big lights on that we've got. I'll just I'll just pull this to a close with you. Um, I, I took a year out of teaching and um, started writing because I had a sabbatical which was unpaid so I did some freelance work and I started writing to different people and one of them was a, um, an institution called the Open College of the Arts. So um, I was also designing um, the website which I'll just touch upon. So I designed the website for the family who wanted to Leslie Prendergast, Peter's wife, and the family wanted to, you know, they had these masses of paintings, you know, there was a massive reverberation really, and, and the estate, you know, with paintings and sketchbooks, and they wanted some way of archiving it, and part of that was, was to um, create this website. There's a lot of stuff on there, and I'm not going to go through it all, um, but it, the web address is prendergast.co. As I said, I'll put this up on Moodle for you to access all these all these names that we talked about this afternoon. But in particular, they wanted um, some unseen work, you know, some of the work from the sketchbooks to be shown, and also some of the studio shots. And what Owen was saying before about um, you know these 
great artists. I had trouble when I was a young student <coughs> sort of identifying with these great artists with Picasso and Matisse and Van Gogh. I, I had trouble connecting with them. And it's only later on that I realised that these are just people, you know, it sounds naff to say it in that way, but they, they're just people like, like you and I. Um, so some of these shots are quite beautiful around the studio. And um, so it's quite, it's quite poignant in a way, but it's quite an insight, it's quite a wonderful resource, that website. Um, and that really is where I close um, that little selection of slides. And um, maybe, you know, this shot of the studio, these photographs were taken by Daisy Prendergast, uh, Peter's daughter, and um, it captured the studio on the day that he died. And uh, we've got some paintings here of, of Peter Prendergast, self-portraits, which from throughout his life. But maybe Owen, you need to talk to us a bit about the paintings and about the sketchbooks a little bit. I, I will do brief. I don't, don't, yeah. I don't want to say, say a huge amount. Really. Um, well, I can if you like. I mean, if you want me to, I'll just sort of show these. I'm going to turn these lights on. I have to say on behalf of my father, actually, that the <coughs> image on the end there isn't a complete image. Okay? So that, that, it's not a resolved image, that's quite important for me. Um, because when he died, we felt it really important to honour his decision as to when the painting was finished or wasn't finished. He'd work in the studio, and he would, sometimes, as Jane was saying yesterday, he would work, he would work on images for you know, not just months, but for years. You know, he would revisit things. Yeah. When it's quite a decision to make whether something's finished, as you're beginning to find out yourself. When it was finished, it would move its way to the paint store. As soon as something went to the paint store, and as far as we're concerned, it can go out there. So we've got a lot of work that's unfinished, which will never see the light of day. But we you know, thought long and hard about this image. It's quite poignant for me, to me, is this image up here, which is the studio with this conservative which was built on, which he actually only got to use for a few months towards the end of his life, unfortunately. On the, on the day that he died, we were sat in, you know, there was nothing to say, with a little laugh in my, in my ear voice, you do have to have a bit of humour sometimes, don't you? We were sat in my mother's living room, and I was just looking up at this view here. And you can't quite see it here. I said, saw my dad looking at me. I don't believe in ghosts. Uh, it, gave, it actually made me, gave me quite a start. There was this painting here, which was all up on an easel looking out the window. And it's not finished. But it, at that moment, I realised that that image had something that you can't necessarily put words to. Yeah, actually, a look about him, he, he really had <coughs> captured himself. I recognise him as, a, as his son, you know, yeah. it, it was, he was looking at me. Um, that's my per personal story about that, but lots of people seem to see So we did label on a hard back whether, you know, think on a hard back whether um, we should use it. We did end up using it in the book. Um, but also it tells you something about how an image can be structured, built, constructed, Oh, I know what I was going to show you. I was going to show you that um, just when you're talking about how an image can be constructed, um, and I thought we were talking, we won't get onto the sketchbooks, it doesn't take up too much time, but I was going to show them this. This is a little YouTube clip. The sound is terrible, the quality is terrible, um, but it's a little YouTube <coughs> clip of Maurice Popple, that painter we were talking about, who's you know known for these large scale abstract paintings doing a, a charity clip for um, sight savers. And it's him reaching the end of his life. He died a couple of years ago now, um, two years ago actually. So it's quite interesting looking at these men who have you know, made it within their painting careers. And I, I just want to show you this because you're going to be making self-portraits and I wanted you to see somebody who was a well-known artist making a quick self-portrait. Yeah. And then we will um, we'll look at these sketchbooks because they're fantastic. For two or three years I've been working uh, with sight savers um, in support of their Junior Painter of the Year award and it's been uh, a great pleasure to do that, you know, to meet all these young artists from all over Britain 
um, and see the work they've been producing at their various schools. The theme of the uh, competition or the exhibition is to be how I see myself. Well, I've been thinking about it and I would like to see myself as some kind of superhero, you know, the kind of artist who rips off his shirt and shows this big A inside you know, to show what a super kind of artist I am. But I'm going to try to do a self-portrait without a mirror to see if I can remember after 70 odd years what my face really looks like. So we'll have to see what, what, what happens. It might be a disaster or it might be um, an interesting work of art. Odd picture for me because it's something that I didn't anticipate. You know, I just started working with without a mirror, trying to remember what my um, old face um, looks like. Even though I'm very familiar with it, you know, having to shave it every morning. Um, nevertheless, you still may not be very familiar with all of your features. Some prominent ones. I know I've got a rather lump again of nose, and I know I've got a, an extremely bald head. Um, so those were the prominent things that were sort of fixtures and then the rest of it just uh, kind of developed very rapidly uh, you know, uh, as you see. So Morris, when we, the Peter Protest Prize was first put in place, Morris came up and um, awarded the prize the first year. Um, so I hope we get some good responses to it this year. Um, and I'm going to turn these lights on so we can look at these sketchbooks. Um, I would mention this one, the, <coughs> the foundation sketchbook. So this is quite an old thing now. Um, and it's quite a strange thing. It's quite strange when it first came into the office yesterday morning. Um, and it's still quite a strange thing. I, I love books. I work with books a lot. And I, it's, it's wonderful for me to handle something like this, which in itself is kind of like a piece of found art. You know, it, it's got um, it's got High Street, Upper Tidian address, Peter Friend gas, and then of course it's full of, so before you've even opened it, it's a kind of thing of, sort of, a thing of beauty. And then you've got page after page, you haven't seen it in a while until you found it this week. No, no, I haven't. No, yeah. no. You sort of, you're left with all this stuff yeah. if, if uh, a pair of splits. Yeah. Um, and you, you, the natural thing to do is to catalogue the paintings, and you start, I say, you know, I've done it, but I love this stuff. It's a really good mm -hmm. little bit of help from the class. Then you catalogue all the drawings. And it's this huge pile of sketchbooks, because he did used to work prolifically in these things. Um, I'm terrible, I always... As, well, I think as you do when you grow up, you always intend to keep diaries, don't you? I mean, some people do keep diaries, I was always awful, you know, you start one and it lasts till January the 4th, isn't it? Um, because Jane was organising this, I said I'll bring some sketchbooks and I went and looked at the pile, and literally I have probably 250 and 100 sketchbooks. Yeah. I thought, well, where do I start? So I thought, well, the obvious thing, foundation sketchbook, and just take, you know, one at regular intervals, you know, throughout 40 years of working as an artist. And um, where was I going with that? Yeah, diaries. And you know, I looked through it and sort of 
Because you always had a book, you always had a sketchbook, you was always drawn as a performance of me, my sister, my brother, my dog, mm. um, friends, you know, things going on, and it's sort of almost my, like my life sort of plotted through drawing this. So um, that's my take, it's going to be yeah. very different for you. Well, one of my favourite little drawings in it was Emrys mentioned his art teacher in school, who mentioned yeah. that he, yeah. you know, he hadn't done brilliantly academically, you know, he was, he was going to go and work in the, in the coal mine, he wasn't going to work in the coal mine until uh, this art teacher, Goma Lewis, has a little drawing of him, because he kept in touch with Goma throughout his life, just as my father kept in touch with Frank Arbach throughout his life, Frank Arbach, the family is still going strong. But Goma had been in Japanese prisoner of war camps during the war, and had, a, had had a horrendous time, and partly to um, repair himself afterwards, he, he worked as an artist and he worked in the secondary modern school in Labrador, but he did it really, really seriously. Again, in the film that you'll hopefully have the opportunity to watch at some point, but Dad talks about him teaching them how to paint like um, Pollock. He used to look at Picasso, he used to look at you know big, important, contemporary things that's going yeah. on. Yeah. And he kept in touch with them and go over when he retired and actually moved to Adelos, not that far away from where my dogs lives, mm -hmm. and bought a small farm. And this is just a little drawing of him shortly before Goma himself died. But do feel free to have a look through. The only one I'm slightly fragile about is the one that James has um, shown you through because it's a bit fragile, but you know, we want them to be seen. And as I said earlier on, I, it's easy to put people on a pedestal and it's <coughs> me looking at these because of sketchbooks, we talk to foundation students about a lot, isn't it? We talk to you about the importance of, of sketchbooks, and one of the reasons I think why they're so good and so important when, for example, you go for an interview, is that an interviewer can almost see your soul, because when you're working between pages, you're not self-conscious, mm -hmm. and you're insecure, you can draw in your insecurities and all sorts of things, and actually, a lot of the time, the pen is a very insecure man, wasn't it? Yeah, but I, and I think that the, the drawings, I mean, as you say, you see different periods of time. There's some of those you can see he's in the life room. He's, yeah. he's drawing the model when he's it's teaching. Just, that's yeah. the foundation student yeah. on the drawing. Yeah. But also, yeah, you, you can see the struggle with him. You can yeah. see the frustration of it, having the, the funny little notes to himself. The, the sorts of doubts that we all have. Sometimes you don't think these people who hear of have those self doubts. Of course they do. That's ordinary. Yeah, I, I saw something yesterday about this whole thing of like you've got to go beyond words that you've written down. Yeah. Sketch. But self portraits as well, because then we yeah, said you used to look at Rembrandt self portraits. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but by all means, carefully feel free to look through them. And that sketch of Jane just picked up. There's only got a few of the sketches that was on the window sill of the studio when mm -hmm. uh, died. So like we said yesterday when we were talking, um, this is his last sketchbook. And I, I think that's what's extraordinary to me as well, as many other things in this process. But this sketch made when, you know, a couple of days probably before we died. So you've got this sketchbook of a young man and this sketchbook of an old man and the whole life in between. And I think that's that's a real um, it's a treasure, isn't it? And so you know, I see said that artists never finish what they do, it's just that they stop.